carnival. I think the achievement pressure looks good. Tom right now. Water towers fly! Yes! go down to nominal. Bring it and see dog. Yikes. You bet. Okay. We don't need any more of these. All right, let's get a 5 by 5 sound check from chat just to make sure you can hear us. How you guys doing today? All right, looks good. Hi, everybody. Welcome to NASA Space Flight Live. It's the weekly show where we talk about all the news going on in the space industry every single week. Uh, today, we've got Ian Atkinson. Hello. Hey, how's it going? And we have Thomas Burghardt joining us. How's it going, guys? And we're going to be talking about a whole bunch of different subjects. Uh, we've got a whole bunch of news about commercial... Uh, Cruise for SpaceX and Boeing. Uh, we've got a re recap of the Soyuz MS-19, which brought a film director and actress to the ISS. Uh, and actress in space will talk about the new Shepard NS-18, which has William Shatner boldly going where he's never gone before. <laughs> and we'll finish up today with some Starship. How are you guys doing today? I'm doing great. Good to be back on NSF Live. And Ian, welcome back to the show. It's been a minute. Yeah, it's been a hot minute. It's been a, probably like six months or so, but yeah, glad to be back, honestly. A lot of fun. All right, so let's go ahead and start talking about the commercial crew news that's uh, going on. Yeah, we've got uh, actually a lot of kind of small updates, but on, on pretty much everything regarding commercial crew. Crew 3 is coming up next, and we're looking at that crew there. Uh, they're launching at the end of this month. That'll be uh, Raja Shari commanding on his first ever space flight, and then NASA astronaut Thomas Marshburn making his third, a German astronaut Matthias Marr making his first flight, and NASA astronaut Kayla Barron making her first ever space flight. And I just got to point out my favorite fact about this flight already. Turns out, according to an interview done a couple of days ago, Kayla has never seen a rocket launch, like ever. She's a NASA astronaut making her first space flight at the end of this month and has never seen a rocket launch before. Is that going to be the first one she sees? Her no. first, well, I don't know. Have you seen a rocket launch if you're yeah. on the thing? like <laughs> I was just thinking that like she's, she's technically... Even when she's on the space station, she's never going to have seen a rocket launch before. <laughs> if you look out the window, I guess that counts, right? I don't know. Maybe. Um, but anyway, that's the first mission coming up. But then there's some news coming up on some of the other missions that are coming a little bit farther down the line. Uh, of course, Boeing Starliner is the other commercial crew spacecraft. And they had their second orbital flight test scheduled for earlier this year, which was postponed now due to a valve issue and that service module. And we do have an update from Boeing uh, just yesterday saying that they have, quote, identified the most probable cause for valve issues in that service module. Um, they're working on, like, finally verifying that that is the actual root cause, but they're confident enough that they've started implementing corrective actions and things like that. Um, and they are now targeting that flight for no earlier than the first half of next year, 2022. So what that means is we're going to have Crew 3 launching this month, and then Crew 4 is going to be launching in April of 2022. And hopefully between those two flights, there will be a slot for Starliner to make its uncrewed test flight um, prior to a crewed flight test. Um, so that's the status of that mission. NASA trying to bring the second commercial crew vehicle online. Um, and that's going to put, I mean, the crew flight test schedule is something that'll be interesting. Um, that could even fall as late as after crew five, SpaceX crew five. And that's significant because of another bit of news that comes out of here with some crew reassignments. Um, Nicole Mann was previously assigned to the Starliner crewed flight test, of basically the Boeing equivalent to SpaceX Demo 2. Um, and then Josh Casada, who was originally assigned to Starliner 1, or the, the Boeing equivalent of SpaceX Crew 1, um, have both been reassigned to SpaceX Crew 5. And the reasoning behind that is, as Starliner gets delayed, these astronauts who are sitting assigned to a certain mission aren't getting any spaceflight experience because they're waiting for that mission to be ready. And because NASA's got the Artemis program coming up, other International Space Station missions, those astronauts do need to be getting certain spaceflight experience so they can prepare for the next mission. Um, so in order to get those two crew members to the ISS in a somewhat reasonable time frame, uh, they are moving them to SpaceX missions that have a little bit more schedule certainty because that's an operational vehicle. Um, that's just something interesting to think about. And there's kind of implications with the Artemis program where you're thinking, like, do astronauts need to go to the ISS prior to going on an Artemis mission and stuff like that? Um, they didn't really say that specifically, so there could be other missions they have in plan. But either way, um, just a sign of kind of the difference between the status of Starliner and Crew Dragon. Um, 
what well, I don't know. I want to open this up to discussion a little bit. What are we thinking about um, the fact that you know Crew Five might launch before CFT? <laughs> Ian, yeah, that's. I'm not really sure the best word to describe that. It's like confusing, maybe a little concerning that the flight, the, the schedule has slipped this far, but then it's also good that SpaceX has the capability and NASA trusts SpaceX enough to transfer a little more missions to SpaceX while Boeing um, fixes the issues they've had with Starliner. So it really shows NASA's trust in SpaceX, which is an excellent sign, great partnership going on there. But at the same time, yeah, it is a bit concerning that they're still working on the root cause of OFT2, that it's something so specific on such like a little part of valve that they're not entirely sure what the problem is yet, even after several months of investigating. But it's good that they're willing to swap around schedules. And like you said, it's good that they're also trying to get astronauts flight experience before they fly on Artemis because Artemis is gonna be such um, an ambitious uh, program and you're gonna to wanna to have astronaut experience for such important missions, walking on the moon. The, like with the Apollo program, most Apollo astronauts did have experience before where um, on the Mercury missions or on the Gemini missions on the X-15. So Apollo wasn't all rookies and Artemis in the same light, it really shouldn't be all rookies either. So I think this is a great um, move for NASA to get experience across all of their astronauts to really widen the number of astronauts that could fly on future Artemis missions. And I do want to talk about, so the status of the actual hardware on OFT2, like you said, the problem is these valves that are in the service module of the spacecraft. And that service module, you can actually see in this picture, you see the gray sort of cone-shaped capsule. And then below that, there's a bit of a white cylinder. Below that, there's a slightly not as bright white cylinder. Uh, the middle cylinder is what I'm talking about there. That's the service module. It's got the abort engines. It's got the maneuvering thrusters. Uh, you can't see it in this picture, but the solar panels are also on the bottom of that. So once the spacecraft separates, it has solar power. Um, and so that module, there are propellant valves in there that they've been having issues with. There are two possible uh, paths forward for them to get the hardware ready. Yes, thank you, Michael. Um, whereas they could work on this service module and fix the problems on this module, or if they think that's gonna take too long, they've also started building the next couple service modules and the next one in line could simply have the actions implemented there since they're still kind of finishing up building it use that on OFT2, and then they'll work on fi fixing this one for a different mission, and they'll just swap them. Um, they haven't decided which one is needed yet, but they're going to do one of those two things to get the hardware ready. Um, and yeah, as far as, you know, keep in mind that this is OFT Starliner still in development, right? It's a new career vehicle. Um, people are going to make whatever jokes they want to make about Boeing and legacy aerospace companies, you know, and maybe some of that's valid but it is worth pointing out that spacex didn't have a smooth development trend either they blew up a dragon capsule like uh so there there's it's important to get this work right it's human space flight you don't want to take any risks of course um and so it's a great thing that there were two low earth orbit crew transport vehicles so that crew dragon finished their development work first and they got operational um so that since starliner has had these delays they have time to get it up and running um, in the long term, there's some other considerations now that have started coming out. And we're going to talk about that in a second. Uh, but in the short term, this you know space is kind of covering for Starliner. Um, also, well, th th so the other point that I'll make is since Starliner is still in development at this point, a lot of people have had some doubts about how SpaceX does their development and there's very quick iteration process, break things fast and keep going. And some people have thought that that might not be a good thing and that doing a lot of preliminary testing and design testing prior to building your first hardware or substantial hardware is actually the better way to go. I um, think there's some pretty strong evidence to the contrary now. What do you think? Yeah, this, yeah, this has been, it's definitely shown the big differences between legacy um, space, like you were saying, legacy space flight versus new space, um, where new space is more just like throw stuff at the wall and see what sticks you know whereas old space is very let's methodical let's use stuff from the shuttle program because starliner is kind of but not really a space shuttle cockpit crushed into a capsule mm -hmm. a little bit um like that description <laughs> whereas the dragon dragon 2 is more or less clean sheet it is kind of like a dragon 1 modified but even right. the dragon 1 is very new architecture and dragon so, 1 was clean sheet for sure yeah. so 
So Dragon 2 is almost clean sheet. But also, like with SpaceX, like you were saying, just throwing stuff at the wall, seeing what sticks. SpaceX has a lot of flight history with Dragon. They've done a lot of testing. You know the McGregor test site. They will test individual components, every engine. They will test every... uh, I don't know what they're called. They test valves. They will test actuators. Everything they will test before flight. And I think that's showing maybe it's just an isolated example here, but maybe it does show that individual component testing over time before you have a final project may be a more efficient way forward. Again, that's just based off this one example, and it'll have to see first up with NASA investigations through OFT2, but also it's just a single example, like I said. I mean, it's also worth pointing out there is at least one other example of SpaceX rapid iteration development potentially going faster than certain old space companies developing similar capabilities, something along the lines of Starship and SLS. You know, like SLS program has existed for a very long time. They're coming up on their first orbital test flight. Starship has existed in active development for way less than that. It is also approaching their first orbital test Mm -hmm. flight in an almost comparable time frame. So... Yeah. Um, but you know, and there's benefits to, and cons to, to each approach for sure. But um, it is definitely cool to see that that new approach that SpaceX has brought to the table is actually working, and that's exciting for um, future developments for not just them, but for maybe other companies if they start to adapt that approach. Uh, we might see faster development for new vehicles and stuff like that, um, or just new ideas coming out. So that's cool to, to kind of point out. Yeah. Um, Uh, Also, like you said, too, SpaceX has had their fair share of issues. And like you said, they blew up a Dragon capsule mm -hmm. um, and they've had to like what we're saying, Boeing may have to shift around some hardware from um, uh, their crude flight test to OFD2. SpaceX had to do that, too. The they were originally going to refly the crew Dragon Demo 1 capsule on the in-flight abort. That capsule exploded on the test stand because of a valve issue. Mm hmm. Um, and they had to shift forward the Crew 2 capsule to fly and fight abort. They had to push all the manifest one mission forward. Um, and maybe that'll have to happen here, and maybe it won't. Hopefully they can just get it fixed quickly, but we'll again, we're going to have to wait and see what NASA and Boeing choose to do to move forward. If there's one thing you all learned today is that space valves are not easy, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, even the little things can be very difficult to, to operate reliably. Um, the other thing, and I know we're going to do a bunch of Q&A, so if you've got questions about Commercial Crew, put them in chat, and I know Matt's going to be pulling them out. Uh, one other kind of bit of news that wraps into this whole Commercial Crew discussion is the more longer-term effects on the program. So Crew Dragon is going to be up through Crew 3 this month, Crew 4 next April, and then Crew 5 in the fall of 2022. Each operator was operated, uh, was awarded excuse me, six operational crew missions. Um, so SpaceX has been awarded up to Crew 6, basically, and then Boeing has up to Starliner 6, which is, at least is the nomenclature NASA has been using. Boeing might have their own name, but since they haven't flown yet, we haven't like seen that. Um, so that's how many missions they've each been awarded so far. Um, it wouldn't be unreasonable for SpaceX to be awarded some additional missions on like an ext- a contract extension since Boeing was delayed. Alternatively, they could just open up the second, like the phase two commercial crew uh, contract awards, just like they did for the commercial cargo program. Um, where in commercial cargo, they actually onboarded that not only they gave more missions to Northrop Grumman and SpaceX for their cargo vehicles, they also onboarded the cargo Dream Chaser spacecraft, um, which will debut in theory no earlier than next year, maybe the year after. Um, but, uh, for the same thing for commercial crew, a phase two contract would likely offer additional contracts to SpaceX and Boeing, should they be willing to compete for those, um, as well as potentially onboard any new vehicles. First of all, space, I think there's no doubt that SpaceX will want to continue flying Crew Dragon beyond the initial contract, but Starliner has a less certain future, and this is based on, I'm going to pull one comment that came from uh, Steve Stitch, which is the commercial crew manager at NASA this week, who said, quote, Boeing will fly all of its Starliner crew missions on Atlas V. Now, I'm trying not to read into this too much because there could have been other contexts that he, were, he was referring to. But if you take that word for word, that suggests that there are no plans to fly Starliner on any rocket other than Atlas V. Atlas V is slated to be retired, not super soon, but in the next few years. ULA, the operator of Atlas V, says that they have sold their last Atlas V. Granted, that could mean that they've also sold Boeing some additional Atlas Vs, and they just haven't announced that yet. Can't rule that out, per se. But if that hasn't happened, or even if it has, 
that means there's a last Starliner mission scheduled right now. And unless they decide to put Starliner on a different vehicle, which from an engineering standpoint, they can. Starliner was designed to be launch vehicle agnostic. It can go on any rocket. So, and well, any rocket with the like master orbit capability. So it could go on Vulcan, which is of course ULA's successor to Atlas. That would probably make the most sense. It could, in theory, launch on Falcon 9, which would be entertaining. Um, however, if they wouldn't want to, there's no point in doing that alongside Crew Dragon, which also launches on Falcon 9, because it's not actually redundant in that sense. Um, I saw one person suggest, what if they launched it on like Ariane 6, um, which in theory could occur, although you would need to either add a launch site in Flor a launch pad in Florida that could support Ariane 6, or crew arm architecture in French Guiana, and then launch American crews from French Guiana. I don't think either of those are really going to happen. Also, I'm, I think NASA would just prefer to launch on American rockets anyway. Rocket Lab's Neutron rocket will, in theory, be crew rated, although that's probably a few years away from even making their first flights, let alone being crew rated. Um, so yeah, there's, there's kind of limited options, and it makes you think what happens if Boeing does not want to continue the Starliner beyond initial contracts, and then NASA's only low Earth orbit crew transfer vehicle is Crew Dragon and then maybe occasional Soyuz flights, um, which we think should hopefully be resuming before too long as far as NASA astronauts going back over there as well. But anyway, what are your thoughts on the future of Starliner maybe beyond Atlas V? Yeah, that that's that's a big question because Vulcan is the most obvious choice. Of course, right. like you said, they could do Falcon 9. That would absolutely be possible, but NASA would not want that. You would not want because if there's an issue with Falcon 9, say if there's an issue on a um during testing or if there's an issue during a flight, you lose both of your or, or low Earth orbit access vehicles instantly. Right. Um, but then also that's at the same point, we don't have that many medium to heavy lift launch vehicles right mm -hmm. now. There's a large influx of small launch vehicles right. and a few super heavies coming along, but yeah, other than Vulcan, Falcon 9, Ariane 6, and possibly Neutron, that's really all that we have right now. And Neutron's future is very uncertain. I think it's still very deep into development. Right. Uh, it's currently supposed to launch from Wallops Pad 0A, which then that would need to be um, have crew. They would need to have crew um, quarters installed at Wallops. They would need to have a crew arm installed at Wallops. A lot of work to be done there. So I think Vulcan would probably be the obvious choice. But again, Vulcan hasn't flown yet. BE4s are still finishing up development, so it's probably going to be a little while before we even get close to an answer on what will happen after Starliner 6. Man, I'll... jump in, and I'm yeah. going to... Uh, we need to do some Super Chats, and we got a huge question queue that's starting to pop up already. Cool, let's do it. Uh, <laughs> you, you guys are ready to go today. Um, <laughs> just a reminder, at NASA Space Flight is the command you need to use in chat when you're posting a question. If you tag us at NASA Space Flight, it'll pop up in our question queue, and we'll be able to get your questions answered. Uh, we do have some Super Chats coming in from Brian Ogren. Uh, thank you for becoming a member. We really appreciate that. Uh, Moldy Space Industries gave ten dollars to the Thomas Space Club or <laughs> Thomas Fan Club. Sorry, what's up, Moldy Space? Uh, Musical Wolves with two dollars saying, "Should Starliner be launched from Scrub Pond, Florida? <laughs> from where in Florida? <laughs> Scrub Pond, Florida. Musical Wolves always has jokes. <laughs> that's that's the oh. recurring theme. And then uh, we we have a." Uh, Four, four pounds from uh, Tim W. who says, Thomas, uh, hello, Thomas, Ian, and Matt. Hello. So, <laughs> and just a normal question queue. You don't have to pay us in order to get your questions answered. Uh, we had Chad Simplisco saying, Hi, NASA Space Flight. Given that two of the three first Starliner crew is transferring to Crew 5, do you think NASA should consider the Dream Chaser more seriously? S so absolutely so the current status of dream chaser and this is kind of the obvious uh spacecraft that came up when people said well, what if starliner gets retired in the near term so dream chaser is this cargo spacecraft that is going to debut it's going to launch on vulcan um, and be used to deliver cargo to and from the international space station um, starting with vulcan's second flight which should be either next year or the year after um that and there is a crew version kind of design out there in fact they've done 
their landing test, which is with this vehicle you see here, which is actually the crew version of the vehicle. Um, but in the near term, the only vehicle that's actually planned to fly to space is the cargo vehicle. And there is a fair bit of work to be done um, to finish that and then also adapt it as a crew vehicle. The cargo vehicle can be launched in a payload fairing, like it's a satellite, um, which simplifies aerodynamics during launch. You'll notice it's a space plane. And if you put a space plane on top of a rocket, you have these weird engineering problems where you have aerodynamics at the top of the rocket and that help makes it a little more difficult to control and you need to balance that very carefully. Not that it can't be done, but it is a, just an added engineering challenge. It's not as easy as stick it on top like a capsule is, which is just kind of symmetric and aerodynamic in that sense. Um, so you can't, and you can't put a crew vehicle in a fairing basically. Um, technically Soyuz is in a fairing, but the fairing has abort motors on it. Um, and then the capsule can separate out of it. That's not as easy for a space plane. Um, so this, you need some sort of in-flight abort system on that. Um, so it wouldn't be trivial to do that. However, is that the next place they would go? Probably. It's about as close as you'll get. You'll already have the cargo version online and you can work to bring the crew version on. Um, I don't know. Can we can we jokingly revive Ares One and Orion in that sense? <laughs> Ares One fan club. Let's go. Let's go. Listen, there was a, <laughs> <laughs> there was at one point uh, Ares One was actually supposed to take have a role for low Earth orbit transportation in addition to the Constellation program for uh, Moon and Mars missions. But um, jokes aside, I think Dream Chaser would be the next place to go. But it's not as easy as some people might think it is. Like. Crew Dream Chaser is not imminent. Um, in fact, right now, it's not even guaranteed to happen. NASA has to invest in it if they want it. Yeah, also um, with that, yes, it is possible to make Crew Dream Chaser. There's still a good bit of work to go. Um, but also it's, also the issue comes up is what launch vehicle would Crew Dream Chaser fly on? Um, so Dream Chaser right now is flying on Vulcan and Vulcan only. Just like Starliner, Dream Chaser is technically vehicle agnostic. So sure, you could fly Cargo Dream Chaser on Falcon 9. You could fly on Ariane 6, H2, or whatever. NASA wouldn't really like that because then you start to have you start to lose you start to have commonality between launch vehicles, which they don't like, uh, which we discussed before. But um, also, then you would have a crew v you have two different types of crew vehicles flying on Vulcan, Starliner and Dream Chaser. If we choose to go down the Starliner on Vulcan route, so. Vulcan would need to be crew rated either way for two of the likely options uh, going forward in commercial crew. So to add on to that, I think the most reasonable path forward, and if, if NASA really is dedicated to maintaining two crew vehicles to the ISS, which may be a wrong assumption, maybe they say, all right, Boeing doesn't want to continue the Starliner program. SpaceX, you're our low Earth orbit vehicle, and they go from there. Probably not what we'd want to see. But there is all, but there is also Soyuz, and so it, it's not completely not redundant. You just don't have redundant domestic access. But either way, let's say NASA says no, we do want two. The easiest option is likely to crew rate Vulcan and then put Starliner on Vulcan launches. And that we're not saying that that can't happen. It just sounds like that's not really a plan right now. Um, the next easiest option, if that's not available, if Boeing doesn't want to continue operating Starliner would probably be to develop the crew version of Dream Chaser and launch it on probably Vulcan. Um, because again, as, if that's not, if Starliner on Vulcan isn't happening, then Vulcan is the only crew vehicle launching on Vulcan is Dream Chaser. Um, but again, that's also not a given and NASA needs to make the decision to actively develop that. Quick thank you to George Miranda for the $5. Really appreciate that. Uh, John Ferris asks, uh, pretty, kind of related here, uh, at Nest Space Light, will Starliner run out of launchers? Right, so we kind of touched on ULA has sold their last Atlas V, um, which means that if Starliner wants to fly additional missions beyond what they've got so far already planned, they need to go to a new launch vehicle, which again would likely be Vulcan. Um, so that's kind of where this concern is coming from, where NASA and Boeing both continue to not say that, yes, we're going to continue with Vulcan after Atlas V retires. Like, but they've been asked that several times because that seems like the obvious path forward, but they keep saying that oh, all Starliner missions are planned for Atlas V. That's been their answer, which kind of signals that they don't actually plan on using Vulcan. So it's that's where this concern is coming from, basically. Yep. 
And also, actually, just real quick comment. Now, you mentioned that all Atlas V rockets have been sold. Mm -hmm. So Starliner is limited, currently, currently limited to how often it can launch. That means that there are no opportunities at the moment for there to be any commercial Starliner flights. Right. So unless they choose to go with Vulcan, of course, if they choose to go with Vulcan, then they're wide open for how many Starliner flights. But right now, they are locked into just being a NASA customer. So take that as you will. Maybe they're not that interested in commercial services. Maybe there haven't been much um, interest in Starliner as a commercial service, but that that's take that as you may. We have uh, $10 here from Rough Rider Show, uh, and we have we have a, just a huge question queue right now, so I'm going to try to move us through Good, keep a little, it going. little bit quicker. Um, will they ever simultaneously fly Starliner on F9 and Vulcan? Would that ever be a consideration? Um, I don't think so. If, if you're going to continue flying the Starliner vehicle, you would pick one launch vehicle for it to go on. Um, when you add, if you had Starliner on two different vehicles, both of those launch sites need to have a Coraxis arm that is compatible with the vehicle. Um, the Starliner teams have to be working with two completely different launch systems. That's an unnecessary complication. That doesn't give you anything. Um, generally speaking, to have two completely dissimilarly redundant vehicles, so two ways for us launches to get crew to the international space station that are completely separate from one another you want it to be at different launch sites so 39a for spacex and 41 for boeing um, two different spacecraft starliner and crew dragon and two different rockets atlas 5 and falcon 9. you want everything to be completely separate best you can that's kind of the point we're making all right, we had a question here from Joseph Shetler, who asks, how many crewed orbital flights will SpaceX fly before Boeing flies one? Uh, over under is nine, I'm betting over. Nine? Ooh, that's a lot. So, <laughs> yeah, so far bad. they've done Demo 1, Crew 1, and Crew 2, and Inspiration 4, excuse me, so that's four. Uh, crew 3 is at the end of this month, pretty much guaranteed that's going to go before Starliner, so let's make that five, and then... They're not going to have a crewed Starliner flight before Crew 4, so add that to 6. The Axiom 1 mission is slated for earlier next year, 7. There's also a private mission for a company called Space Adventures in there. So, all right, you know what? Let's say like Space, can... Ad I, Space Adventures is very vague on their schedule, so, so I'm going to not count them for a second, but there is... Crew five might also be before safety, so that's eight. <laughs> and let's say another one slides in there just because it's Boeing, <laughs> and and they might slip a little bit anyway. Okay, so you know how I said that over under was ridiculous. <laughs> it might not be. <laughs> I th okay, okay. I'm gonna put the over under at eight and a half just to hedge a little bit, but then I might bet the over. <laughs> But but I mean, here's the I thing. I really hope that there's not half of a crude launch. Well, so normally, I mean, the over under <laughs> is supposed to be a half number, right? So it can't be all, like if if it's actually nine, then there was no over. Like that's how over unders work, isn't it? Well, does demo two technically count as half a crew mission? Oh jeez, no, demo two <laughs> counts as one crewed mission. Um, but I, <laughs> all right, hold on, wait a second. Do non-human crews count? Because there were tardigrades and squids on that oh, cargo dragon no. a couple weeks ago or a couple months ago. Anyway, um, oh geez, okay. To the point of the question, yes, Crew Dragon became operational first, so they're going to have a pretty high launch cadence in the near term because they're flying operational missions. They're not doing test flights. They're not doing development. The reasons for that are open to criticism, but it's not you know absurd to think about that. And also, the fact that Crew Dragon is the lower cost of the two vehicles means they have those couple uh, commercial missions in there that Starliner likely won't be as attractive to. Um, also, before Michael takes it off screen, I do want to acknowledge this photo, which is the Vulcan Pathfinder, that first stage for the new Vulcan rocket, being rolled past the Atlas V rocket that will launch the Lucy probe uh, this a week from today, actually, um, and uh, potentially past and or present and future Starliner launch vehicles, maybe. Um, but yeah, so to the point of the question, I will bet the under cautiously. <laughs> Okay, we're gonna do a quick detour here for Yannicka Quilt, who did uh, five Canadian bucks, who asks, "What's going on with Upsilon Five? Oh yeah, so 
Scrubtober is in fact upon us. Soyuz laughs at Scrubs, so you know Soyuz gets a waiver on the whole Scrubtober thing. But uh, two launch attempts for the new for the Japanese Epsilon rocket, this smaller launch vehicle that they only launch a few times um, for small satellites and things like that. First attempt was a ground station problem, and then the second attempt they had upper level winds that were a problem. And now they have an H2 rocket launch coming up that they're going to focus on, and they'll launch Epsilon after that. So Epsilon is delayed pretty much indefinitely. Um, they have a Jap the J Japanese launch sites are moving towards this other mission that's getting ready. They'll come back to the Epsilon mission later. All right. Keeping us moving on, uh, Ross asks, is there any indication yet as to whether NASA will contract SpaceX for crewed launches to the ISS beyond Crew-6? They almost certainly will. It hasn't been officially announced or anything yet, but that's something that we're expecting to happen. It's just a matter of um, when NASA gets around to actually conducting that work, um, whether it's a contract extension on the current phase or beginning the second phase of commercial crew. Um, well, we're expecting that to happen one way or the other. We're just waiting for that to actually occur. They've got a little bit of time. It should be like in the near term, we'll probably hear about it, but they've got time to do that. Uh, let's see. Demigod Dragon, uh, $10 Canadian, says, uh, Starship could do an ISS crew delivery, like using a 747 for a taxi ride. <laughs> require Starship to stay attached to ISS for several months, uh, and thus test long duration, like interplanetary reliability. Oh. Ian, you want to start with this one? Yeah, so this is a question that comes up a lot. Could Starship go to the ISS? Technically, yes. There's really no theoretical reason why it couldn't be able to. Um, but there's also the thing that doesn't come up that I've heard talked about a little bit is the connection to the ISS, the structural um, concerns of that, because you have such a massive vehicle, 100 to 150 tons or so, just hanging off the ISS off one little docking port, which felt like three to five meters. But you have such a large vehicle. And if you're going to, say, reboost the ISS or do some attitude control or reorient the ISS, having that large of a counterweight on such relatively thin and relatively small modules and connections could pose an issue. Again, like that's that's just a possible. No one, no one seriously investigated this. NASA has not seriously investigated this, as far as we know. As SpaceX far as not... we know is the important caveat yes. there. But yes, as Something far I... as we know, and as far as we know, SpaceX has not proposed Starship for. Oh yes, they have. It's on the website. I, <laughs> I meant made a proposal to NASA. Okay. Yeah. We also saw pretty recently uh, the stresses that a vehicle can put on the ISS oh, when geez. things don't quite go as planned, even with a much smaller vehicle. Yeah. So that's a very good point, um, although we would hope that Starship would adequately test their thruster systems uh, prior to visiting the space <laughs> station. And I would also like to point out, when Shuttle went to the space station, it looked similarly ridiculous. <laughs> like, yeah. The size isn't that different between those two vehicles, and it looked absurd. Um, but it's workable, um, and I remember that Starship is actually designed to dock in some ways. It has to dock to the Lunar Gateway, which is even smaller than the ISS. Um, so the idea of docking Starship to the space station is not something we would rule out, um, but it's not. It's also not trivial, right? There, there would need to be work to be done. Yeah. As far as relating that to the conversation about commercial crew, though, keep in mind that if you're looking to replace a vehicle that is supposed to be redundant with Crew Dragon, Starship. While, yes, all the hardware in the Starship system, almost all of it is entirely different from Dragon, there could be avionics similarities and stuff like that. And there are also, for sure, uh, personnel and just company-wide um, similarities between those two. Even if the hardware is different, if they're both operated by the same company, I'm not sure that really counts as dissimilar redundancy. Um, I could be wrong there, because, again, the hardware is almost all entirely different, but... Um, I think they'd be looking for something operated by a company that wasn't SpaceX. Not to say that Starship couldn't take over for the Dragon side of commercial crew. And I think in a little bit of time, SpaceX might want to do that. Um, we're just a little bit of ways out from that being a thing. Before we get to the next question, I do want to give a thank you to Miss Katya T. Moneypenny for the 999. Thank you so much for doing that. Those uh, tips that you give really help us keep the show going and, uh, and, and make sure that we have Plenty of gas in the tank. Uh, a question from Rolf Carmack Anderson, uh, who has a question that I'm actually interested in as, as well. 
Uh, why was Boeing not required to do an in-flight abort test like SpaceX did? Uh, so, so, yeah, go ahead, Ian. <laughs> okay, I was going to say, so there was, if as far as I know, there was no set requirement to do an in-flight abort test. There was a requirement to do a pad abort test, which both companies did do successfully. Um, but the in-flight abort test was an option. Um, however, if, if companies chose not to do a physical in-flight abort test, they would have to run simulations and um, do investigations to exactly what would happen during an in-flight abort test. SpaceX chose to go the physical route and do a physical in-flight abort test with a real Falcon 9, real second stage, um, and a real Dragon capsule, whereas Boeing chose to do more of simulation and investigations into what an in-flight abort would be like. Yep, exactly. All right. Uh, of course, that, it's worth noting that the pad abort test for Starliner was actually a little bit eventful even on its own. One of the Starliner uses three parachutes nominally and only two deployed, um, which and like parachute out redundancy is built into both commercial crew vehicles. Like that's designed to be safe. Um, but uh, a pad abort test looks so cool anyway. I mean, <laughs> a quick but, question uh, yeah. of pacing for you, Thomas. Uh, we've got a ton of questions here for commercial crew still. Uh, just This seems like mm -hmm. a, a subject people really like. Uh, we have Soyuz and New Shepard. Probably not as many questions about those. People always ask about Starship. Do you want to spend a little bit more time in commercial crew? Before yeah, we've we got on? more time for commercial crew, sure. Okay, all right. Um, let's see. Musical Wolves asks, what is ULA's reaction to Starliner astronauts being transferred? ULA's response? Well, from ULA's perspective, the missions are still happening and we'll get different crew members assigned to it. Um, and so I don't think ULA is particularly concerned. Even Boeing said, you know, you know, best of luck to these astronauts on their different crew missions um, and the space station team, because Boeing is also technically the prime contractor for the space station itself. Um, and they said something along the lines of our space station teams look forward to supporting your mission or something like that. Um, so, you know, they swapping astronauts around like there will be other astronauts taking those crew members place um and i think you know neither i mean ula has done everything they need to do boeing is not in any position to criticize that decision based on their own spacecraft's readiness so um i, I don't think it's a concern or anything there you go there is the uh the statement from boeing when uh, that astronaut change was released so and uh another really big thank you here to as Wrenchmaster for $25 tip to the stream saying, no question, just wanted to show my appreciation for you guys. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate this. Yeah, we re really, really do appreciate those. Um, Amiga Clone asks, uh, do you think that SpaceX might get more crew missions to the ISS due to Boeing delays? Potentially. Definitely. Um, I mean, we saw something somewhat similar with the commercial cargo program. Initially, it was going to be um, SpaceX and a company called uh, Kistler. Kistler was unable to finish development and that part of the contract got recompeted where some of those missions went to SpaceX and SpaceX had more initial commercial cargo missions and some of them went to then Orbital Sciences, which became Orbital ATK, which became Northrop Grumman, um, basically the Cygnus vehicle. Um, so yeah, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't have to be balanced 50-50 based on whatever vehicle is more ready at the time. Um, so yeah, if, if Crew Dragon gets a few additional missions than Boeing does, um, that's kind of expected and won't won't be too surprising. All right, let's see here. Paul Kelly asked, uh, "Did Boeing have any tourist missions booked for Starliner besides their NASA flights?" Not, not that, that I'm aware, aware of. of. Yeah, not that I'm aware of. Um, it was publicly like advertised that yeah, we can fly private astronauts. And the other thing is. It doesn't have to be a dedicated private mission. They can have three normal ISS crew members and one private astronaut who's going to stay on the ISS for a certain amount of time. That's happened in the past on Soyuz missions, um, and start, Boeing could do something like that. Um, but as far as we know, no firmly scheduled uh, private astronauts were booked for Starlight. There, are there any crew vehicles in different programs right now that aren't sort of looking towards tourism? Orion? I guess, like, I mean, how would that be? A private astronaut flight, launch on SLS and go to the moon? That would be pretty cool. I would go on. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's awesome. I mean, but, Orion, oh, sorry, go ahead. I was just saying, like, but other than that, I mean, let's see, I mean, Soyuz has already flown Taurus. Crew Dragon obviously has as well. 
the two like American suborbital vehicles, New Shepard and Spaceship Two, both of them are literally designed for tourism. Starliner has been made available for tourists, even though it looks like maybe that doesn't necessarily happen, but it was at least proposed. Um, I don't know about the Chinese like Tianzhou. What if they would fly any private citizens on their vehicle? Um, that would be the only other one that I can't really think of off the top of my head. There's also so the safe Russian... to say that, that we are finally approaching the age of actual space tourism? Depends on what you mean by actual space tourism. Right now, you still need lots of money to be a space tourist. Um, I will determine, I would say we are in the age of space tourism when a middle class person can afford a ticket, which we are nowhere near yet. There's a lot of work to be done. Also, also without extensive training as well. Mm -hmm. Let's see here. Uh, from Dougal, Percy and Ingenuity update. Uh, no more flights for a while? Um, you know, I, I'm not up to date on Percy and Ingenuity. I know uh, a little bit ago, Ingenuity, they aborted a flight attempt because of some, you know, onboard sensor uh uh, not malfunction, but notice they malfunction automatically and stop the flight. And I think maybe they're still investing in that. I'll admit I'm not. I'm not up to date on the Mars 2020 mission for this week. So what, right now, I'm I'm not as I'm not really too deep into Mars 2020 right now either. But I do know that as of right now, Mars. I don't know. There's there's a technical name conjunction, solar conjunction. Mars is on mm. the opposite side of the sun as Earth. And because of that, communications are very limited with our Martian spacecraft. Perseverance right now is just parked. It's it's kind of taking taking a break. Um, mm -hmm. doing I believe it's doing some a well earned uh, break, Percy. You've been do you've been working hard, okay? <laughs> honestly, yeah. But yeah, there, it's in like so we're not really controlling perseverance right now. I believe it's more they're listening because trying to send um, signals either through or kind of around the sun can sort of sort of corrupt them. So if you try to send a flight command to Ingenuity and it gets corrupted in any little, even a little bit, you can lose your spacecraft. So right now they're sort of just pausing Mars operations a little bit. Um, they're still receiving some signals. There's actually a website you can watch the Deep Space Network um, telemetry live, which mm -hmm. is amazing. Um, you, they're getting a little bit of signal back, possibly sending a little bit here and there, but as of right now, it's on a little break. Okay. Uh, thank you real quick to Jim Cavett, uh, who just says, thanks, y'all. Five dollars from them. Uh, and Tony Blue asks, why are NASA focusing on launch vehicles for crew missions to the ISS when there's a chance in the near future that the U.S. will stop funding for the U.S. for the ISS? Ah, uh, so, yes, the International Space Station is a little bit over 20 years old now. In fact, uh, 23 years now? It was launched, in, the first module was launched in, at the end of 98. Um, and so, yes, the, the hardware is aging. And the fact is that at some point, the hardware becomes so old that it's not worth maintaining and you want to replace it. Um, but that means you're going to replace it. There's commercial companies proposing their own space station modules to be launched. Um, the kind of the closest one to actually becoming a reality right now is Axiom, who not only are flying their own private crews to the International Space Station, but are also planning to launch their own modules to kind of add on to the International Space Station. And then once a few of those modules are all launched together, that uh, section can actually separate from the ISS and not free fly on its own, making its own space station, basically. And NASA's for, uh, forward plans basically include, once the ISS really does need to be decommissioned, we will move our low Earth orbit science operations to a privately operated space station like Axioms, for example. Um, and they will hire crew transportation services to that station. They'll fly their experiments there. Their astronauts will work on the station. It'll just be um, a little bit more of a commercial model as far as how those modules were built and developed and launched. But um, the the low Earth orbit research isn't going away. We just might be doing it on a new and upgraded space station. Got it. Uh, we have uh, just a couple more questions here about Starliner. A whole bunch of other questions that are sort of random and scattershot are, are starting to pop up now, so we might be wrapping up on Starliner. If sure. you do have any more, do at NASA Space Flight and ask your question specific to this topic, and we'll try to get it in before we move on. Uh, Paul Kelly asks, could SpaceX be looking at an extended drought of NASA crewed flights after Crew 6 while Starliner catches up? Right, so yeah, the so the spirit of the question being, do NASA, does NASA, since SpaceX is doing all the crew missions in a row, does Starliner do a bunch in a row, meaning that Crew Dragon doesn't fly for a while? Um, 
they could, although there are benefits to trying to alternate, even though Starliner is behind, um, which is why we're thinking they could do a contract extension to Crew Dragon, where Crew Dragon gets awarded to, let's say, up to Crew 9 or something, like three more missions, so that there's like two Starliner missions and then a Crew Dragon mission, and two Starliner and a Crew Dragon. And then by the end of those two phases, they'll kind of be synced up again. Um, and then they can get alternate one for one. And the, the benefits to that being the Crew Dragon teams at SpaceX don't not work for several months and then have to get back into things. Um, the Crew Dragon systems, like the Corexis arm and those relevant umbilicals on the Ethereum 9 a and stuff like that, those systems all continue being maintained and operated. Because um, if you have extended downtime, you can see that that equipment may not operate as reliably as before which we've actually seen not too long ago, the Delta IV Heavy rocket, which is being retired, previous uh, a couple previous missions have had problems because the rocket doesn't launch that frequently and the ground equipment surrounding those rockets hasn't been very reliable. And so ULA has put a lot of work into recently, making sure all the systems are really up and ready to go so they can finish these last few flights more reliably. Um, and so a similar problem could occur if they don't uh, try to keep SpaceX at least flying in, to a certain extent. And uh, probably one last question before we move on here uh, from Aravel, who asks, is there any chance Boeing might sell Starliner to another company if they're no longer interested in future crewed flights? So another company operating Starliner, basically? Yeah, that would be the question. Oh, I, no. Who I don't that... really see that. Is there any precedent for that sort of thing before? Not not with crude, obviously. But... Uh, well, so kind of. The Atlas V launch vehicle was originally operated by Lockheed Martin. Um, before ULA existed, and then the Delta line of rockets was operated by Boeing. And then when Boeing and Lockheed Martin merged their launch services companies to create United Launch Alliance, those two companies were then operated by a new company, even though that company's parents are the original companies. So there's a little bit of that there, but also a company called International Launch Services, or ILS, also operated the Atlas V for a little bit, and they were, it was the same rocket, but being operated by a different company. Um, and they also operated the Russian Proton rocket commercially. Um, so not entirely unprecedented for a one vehicle to be operated by a completely different company uh, in different scenarios. I I don't think it's ever happened for a crew spacecraft, but that's not to say that it wouldn't be too similar. Would that actually happen? I have no idea. Uh, and I did, I guess I lied, because we did have a Super Chat just come in, so I do <laughs> want to get to it from Falcon Heavy, uh, five pounds. Who asks, could Starship effectively replace the ISS and they leave a ship up there for two years and bring it home when it needs repairs? Yeah. Maybe. In I mean, theory? It's got a lot of internal volume, so if you configured one to operate as an orbital laboratory, you could do it. You might want two just to really match the capabilities of the ISS. It'd be a tight squeeze to only do to do everything the ISS does in only one Starship. Uh, but if you had two docked together you'd probably have a similar amount of workspace to work with. Um, so in theory, sure. Yeah, like if you could do, because I know they're looking to do nose-to-nose -nose docking on Starship. So if you have one that's permanently up there, sort of Skylab style, and then you have another one that comes up with, say, cargo, crew, um, ex extra experiment space, things like that, that could be potentially useful depending on how the orbital lifetime of Starship could be. All right, let's go ahead and move on from this. The Russians put Soyuz MS-19 into space. Uh, what was special about this launch? Oh, a few different things that were special about this launch. The most notable being the crew, and uh, you're actually looking at the crew of MS-19. In the middle there is the one Roscosmos cosmonaut on board, Anton Shkaplerov, who previously flew on three different Soyuz missions. This was definitely not his first rodeo, uh, making his fourth trip to the International Space Station. Um, but to his right, our left, is a, an actress, and I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to butcher these names, Yulia Peresild, Peresild, something like that, my apologies, um, a Russian actress going to the station, and then on the right side, uh, film director Klim Shipenko, um, and they are the first film director and actress to go to the International Space Station, and they're actually going to film a couple scenes for a Russian feature film on the International Space Station. It's called The Challenge, and I believe the plot is something along the lines of a doctor, played by the actress, uh, needs to be very rapidly trained to go to the, stations, the space station for some sort of medical emergency that's happening on board or something like that. 
Um, not a whole lot of details, and there's some conflicting reports as to what exactly the plot is. But basically, they're actually going to film on location on the International Space Station, which I think is very, very cool. Um, some this mission has been criticized a little bit. Some people in Russia are like, oh, they're using you know Russian government funds to support a private movie being filmed and stuff like that. There are benefits to the Russian space agency for being able to support this kind of thing. So I can kind of see how that would work if NASA was helping contribute to an American movie being filmed on the ISS, which isn't not happening because Tom Cruise is going to fly on a future Axiom mission and film stuff on the ISS. And NASA isn't not supporting that, even though maybe it's in a more limited role. Um, either way, um, that's a pretty interesting mission. Um, from that standpoint, though, that also means there were three Russians on board this mission. And this is the first Soyuz launch to the ISS with only Russians on board ever. No Soyuz to the ISS has ever launched prior to this without at least one crew member not from Russia on board. Um, this was also the first Soyuz launch without an American on board since 2015. Um, there's been crews with only Soyuz and other international countries on board. Uh, but uh, either way, a uh, pretty interesting mission. And uh, not to distract from the crew on board themselves, but there was also some technical things that were interesting on this mission. The launch went perfectly, um, and we're seeing some gorgeous views uh, from that launch uh, earlier this week. When the same spacecraft arrived at the International Space Station, there was a little bit of drama. Um, the onboard automatic docking system, which is called KURS, K-U-R-S, um, had a malfunction and actually aborted the automatic docking. And uh, Shkaplerov had to take over manual control of the docking and dock it himself. Um, this is not the first time in recent history that a Russian vehicle visiting the ISS has had problems doing an automatic docking. The A couple Progress spacecraft have had similar issues. Um, and because this is the Russian space program, we continue to hear very little about what these what investigations are going on with regards to these issues and what NASA has been told from their Roscosmos colleagues about this. And it's not unfair to be a little bit concerned about this, but um, worth noting that the manual docking went successfully. They were able to dock successfully. Um, and that's why, you know, the cosmonauts are very well trained, just like our own astronauts are. Um, but yeah, it's just continued technical problems coming up on these Soyuz and Progress missions. Um, we have here a question from uh, Amiga. Well, actually, more of a point from, from Mega Clone, uh, who wants to point out that first crew compi comprised of only Russians to visit the ISS. The last time only Russians flew to a space station was the last crew to Mir. Yep. Right, exactly. Yeah, that's a good long time. Yes. <laughs> uh, and then Travis says, uh, the, grab, the gripe about Russia funding the film, the U.S. Department of Defense has on countless occasions supported film production with support, advice, mm -hmm. and performances, and there's really nothing different about that. Off cough Top Gun? I mean, come on. <laughs> like, yeah, I personally don't have a problem with it, but I understand the criticism, but I'm like, I can see why there'd be benefits in that and why the government would want to invest in that. Um, and just from an outside perspective, since I'm not a Russian citizen, obviously, I think it's pretty cool to have films filmed on the ISS, as long as it doesn't interrupt normal science and exploration operations, which it isn't. Um, I think it's kind of cool. Um, yeah, the, can't wait, honestly. Yeah. Really neat to see. Uh, honest, it's also worth mentioning that the MS-19 spacecraft will be bringing both the actress and film producer back home uh, relatively near term on, uh, sorry, I think I misspoke. Well, they'll be coming back on Soyuz MS-18, which has been on the station for a few months already, because uh, they're making a very short stay on the International Space Station. Um, and MS-9, two of the crew members that launched on MS-18 will have a basically a double-length stay, almost a full year on station, before coming back on MS-19. And I believe also another interesting point, I know Soyuz MS-20 and I believe MS-19 as well, they have new flight control um, instrumentation on board. So the commander who sits in the center will have the vast majority of control over the vehicle and the two people on his side or his or her sides um, could be astronauts or they could be tourists who would have limited control of the vehicle only in absolutely necessary situations. So it's not where um, every person in a seat has a certain operation on board the vehicle. Mm -hmm. The commander is now in complete control of the vehicle and the two people next to them are sort of along for the ride. This goes with, I mean, most modern spacecraft, including the Russian vehicles, are 
pretty autonomous. They do almost everything themselves. There's very limited, li very limited manual control you need to do, except for cases of a docking system failure where you need to take over. But um, nominally, it's all very computerized, just like the American vehicles are. Uh, Alejandro points out as well uh, with with 10 euros. Thank you very much for that. We really appreciate it. The actress is also the second female Russian citizen to ever visit the ISS. It would be misleading to point out, not point out that, yes, the proportion of male and female Russian astronauts, cosmonauts, is not exactly representative of perhaps what it should be. Um, but yes, she is only the second. Um, let's see. We have here from Tygen Daroga, uh, who says, what do you think about deeper space station that can be supplied by several starships? Is it worth it? Cheers from Bulgaria. And thank you very much for the, for the tip as well. Well I, well, I think Gateway would sort of count there. Beyond that, yeah. you sort of get problems. So there's that. And I can also think of, um, I think it's called Martian Base Camp, was a concept by Lockheed Martin. Um, basically, the Lunar Gateway, which is NASA being developed by NASA for a lunar orbiting space station, um, Starship will have a role in that as a lander that crew on the station can travel to the surface and back. Um, could also potentially be used, start using Starships to get crew there in the first place if Orion gets retired down the line, um, or to bring cargo there if Dragon XL gets retired. Not that Dragon XL is operational yet. Um, obviously, these are somewhat future plans. Um, so yeah, that that could be conceivable and then if you wanted to have some sort of orbiting station above mars prior to missions to the surface um, or in parallel with missions to the surface um, lucky martin proposed that and they also had a very preliminary design for their own kind of starship-esque you know launcher and lander for mars um, starship could also fill that role um, those are distant plans but definitely something that i think once starship is a little bit close to operational we might start hearing about um, those kind of uh, mission ideas, and that would be very exciting. Well, I think that about does it for us for Soyuz. However, on the subject of actors in space, <laughs> Bill Shatner's going to space? What's the deal? Well, he's been to space so many times already, clearly, right? But <laughs> no, for real this time, Captain Kirk is going to space. Um, the next crew that will fly on Blue Origin's new Shepard rocket uh, the suborbital uh, vehicle that is pretty much designed for space tourism, designed to help uh, people who are not career astronauts experience space flight. Um, that crew will include William Shatner, the actor who played Captain Kirk in the Star Trek uh, franchise, um, among three other people. Uh, the vice president of mission and flight operations at Blue Origin, Audrey Powers, will be joining William Shatner, as well as Chris Bojuzin? Oh God, I probably I, there's no way I pronounce that right. <laughs> <laughs> he's the co-founder of Planet Lads, which is a satellite company, so he's a big aerospace folk. And then uh, uh, Glenn DeVries, who is a private astronaut who bought a seat as well. He's a pilot um, and a uh, very well-off person, clearly. Uh, but four private citizens also taking a ride on the next New Shepard flight. New Shepard flight 18 is scheduled to launch. Oh gosh, the tenth. The 10th, no, okay, the, the 12th, right? 12th, yeah. Yeah, so this coming Tuesday um, is that flight. But, of course, I think all eyes are going to be on William Shatner being on board. Does um, he get the record for the most simulated missions without a launch? <laughs> <laughs> I think there'd be an argument to be made for that, sure. Mm -hmm. There he is. That's him and Audrey, I believe, on the crew access arm at, New Sh at the New Shepard launch site in West Texas. Um, that's a pretty cool shot to see. Uh, if you have any questions, by the way, about this, uh, feel free to tag us with at NASA Spaceflight, and we'll get your questions answered. We do ask that you hold your questions about Starship and SpaceX to the end when we get to that portion of the show. That way they don't all get lost and you have to retype them all. We try to keep it sort of to the subject um, where Travis would like to point out that uh, William Shatner is, is only going where no man has gone before. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Captain Kirk going to space sounds logical. Two dollars for Musical Wolves. Thank you very much, Musical Wolves. Um, Dream Chase will fly unmanned before Starliner flies unmanned. That's twenty dollars from no, it won't. Demands recon. <laughs> That's false. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> but we appreciate the twenty dollars. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, we have another question here from, from Rolf, uh, who asks, with the Progress spacecraft, what do they do in case of a docking system failure? Is it controlled from the ground or from the ISS? I believe uh, ISS, can, people, the Cosmot uh, observing on the ISS can take remote control, right, Ian? Yeah, um, I believe there is possibility of ground control too, maybe, but ISS is definitely the primary route. And I believe in recent history, there have been progress docking failures where the cosmonauts on board the ISS have had to either abort the docking or manually dock themselves. All right. Uh, Gus, who just asks, uh, what do you guys think about the fact that NS-18 is going up and MS-18 is coming down? Uh, oh, <laughs> took oh, me God. a second. Technically, NS-18 is going up and coming down pretty much immediately, so... <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, that's a weird, weird coincidence. We're just going to be confusing the night here bit. with the space programs. There's going to be... A, someone's going to make a typo when referring to one mission, yeah. but type the other one. That's going to be a problem. <laughs> yep. Uh, Fireworking asks, do we know the rest of the crew for the new Shepard launch? Yep, so it's, it's only four total, and it's William Shatner, Audrey Powers, the Blue Origin representative, uh, Chris... B, oh god, I can't say Chris B. That's our <laughs> boss. Oh no, Chris B's going to space. <laughs> I mean, technically correct. Uh, the Planet Labs co-founder, and then Glenn DeVries uh, is the fourth astronaut uh, going on board. Uh, we know New Shepard has a crew complement of up to six, uh, but only four went up on the first crewed mission, and another four are going up on this mission. And they have confirmed that those are the only four on this particular flight. Uh, Credence asks, is this the first time a crew went up on one ship and came down on another? I think the answer to that is, is no, right? No. No, it's, that was actually pretty common. That's happened several times throughout the ISS. Especially, I can remember, example, um, Scott Kelly's year-long stay. He came up on one Soyuz spacecraft. I believe, like, two or three others came up and went down by the time he got back. So, yeah, it's completely normal for crews to switch spacecraft usually they stay on the same spacecraft um especially with as of right now the u.s crew spacecraft seem to have a set crew for launch and landing but with soyuz it is not uncommon to see one or two or even all three crew members swap between vehicles because they're all mostly identical so if you come up on one you can go down theoretically on any other and uh, th to that point, all the crew that goes to the ISS, if you, even if you're launching in Crew Dragon and are expected to land on that same Crew Dragon, you get trained on the very essential Soyuz systems as well. In the case that an emergency occurs or some schedule change happens and you have to land on Soyuz instead. Um, that happens. Um, and also, even back in the shuttle program, there were shuttle flights that would go to the ISS and the crew that went up on that shuttle would not be the same crew that came back on shuttle and you'd land on a Soyuz or... You launched on a Soyuz and landed on a shuttle. Um, and that usually just came down to how long your mission on the ISS actually was. Shuttles didn't spend that long docked to the ISS. They didn't stay docked there for six months like Crew Dragon currently does, um, or Soyuz for that matter. Um, so if you had a long duration stay, you would likely be landing on a different vehicle than you launched on. Um, and the same case is here. We have two crew members that are making a very short stay um, so they're only staying for the handover period between these two Soyuz vehicles, um, and thus that results in two other people having much extended stays on the International Space Station, and thus landing on a different vehicle than they launched on. It also happened, too, during the Mir program. They'd have astronauts, Russian or American, go up, stay on Mir for a while, come down on Soyuz, and go up on Soyuz, come down on shuttle. And Credence wants to follow up their question with uh, a $5 tip, just saying thank you for answering so well. Thank you very much, Credence, for that. Thanks. Absolutely. That's what we're here for. We're here to answer questions and hang out. Good job, guys. You did that so well, we got money for it. <laughs> uh, and WD, <laughs> W4WWW and EMOZ, thank you both for the uh, tips you did earlier as well. We, we really appreciate it. Uh, question from Dank Jeb. How is Chris B flying on a rocket that's not a shuttle? I, well, listen, if the shuttle came out of retirement, Crispy would be getting a seat, okay? <laughs> yeah, we I, not even NASA would know what happened. Crispy would just appear on the man. Like, <laughs> well, we have to. <laughs> just knock on the door. <laughs> like, you oh, got room? <laughs> that's the other thing. We didn't mention this. Crew 3, okay. Crew 3 is launching on October 30th, which means if they dock like the normal timeline, it's usually about 24 hours. They are going to arrive at the ISS on Halloween. So if they don't dock to the ISS, knock on the hatch and say trick or treat, I'm 
I'm going to stop covering the mission. They will have failed the mission. (laughs) They need to do it. They're already dressed up as astronauts. They have to do it, right? Oh, my God. Dressed (laughs) up as an astronaut. (laughs) We just had three questions pop up about the chairs uh, before we we kind of move on here. Uh, Michael Flynn, Matt A, and Sheen Reader, uh, sorry, Sean, all asked about the chairs. Uh, I thought the chairs were molded to the cosmonauts. How do they swap seats between the different vehicles? And do they have to change the seat inserts between Soyuz capsules? There's a lot of questions about this. You know? Yeah. That's a great question. I don't think they, like, un- like move the seats between the spacecraft. I wonder if it's, like, yeah, they're molded to... Well... They are. Oh, yeah, they are molded I'm to I'm going to have cosmic. to research this. That is a great question. That would it would make sense if you were able to swap the inserts? Oh, okay, okay. Michael Baylor, thank you. It says that they do actually move the liner between the two spacecraft, so they take the liner out and move it to the new spacecraft that they're going to come down in. Thank it's you, like Michael. Going into like that. some sort of sci-fi cocoon here. <laughs> <laughs> it's a cryo sleep chamber. Yeah, that's what, it, that's what it looks like to me. Uh, and then a, a question about income: Do we know astronauts get paid a lot, or does the experience mean they don't get too much? Uh, Are you talking about NASA think... or different different companies? Roscosmos cosmonauts get paid not very well. NASA astronauts get paid better, and like ESA astronauts, yeah, um, maybe not enough <laughs> given how much they risk and how much. Well, I don't know. They they spend a lot of time too. Um, there's probably an argument to be made that they should be paid more. Granted, there are also benefits to being an astronaut, but there's a lot of downsides to being an astronaut, like a lot of time away from home and serious health risks and all of those things. Um, I, that's NASA salaries are probably Googleable. And then I know there's been some stories recently about Russian cosmonaut pays that you go, wait, they get paid how much? <laughs> like, it's not, I don't know. I mean, that's Russian business is conducted differently, obviously, but yeah. All right. Well, I think that will probably do us for New Shepard, unless you've got any more comments about it. I think uh, stay tuned for more coverage of that mission here on NASA Space Flight. Yep. We'll definitely be talking more about it next week. In that case, it is time for SpaceX and Starship and all of your SpaceX and Starship related questions. Now is the time to put them into the chat. Uh, tell us what's going on this week with Starship. Yeah, take it away. So... <laughs> As always, there's a lot going on with Starship now. So um, this week, as I've been for the past few months, we've seen a lot of ground support work. Um, a little, the work is still continuing to pick up on vehicle production side. Um, we've seen they're getting ready for static fire testing of Ship 20. Um, it's still residing on Pad B. Uh, Booster 4 is still not on the orbital launch pad. Um, they, uh, they did a lot of testing with the quick disconnect arm this week. Um, it moved under its own power for the first time very very slowly but it did move under its own power and, the and quick really disconnect- quick just to jump in here talking about the orbital launch tower and correct time i want to point out this is a live view i'm being told from michael oh. this is a live view of said orbital launch complex anyway continue ian <laughs> well that's interesting i didn't even i was like oh this is a nice picture no it's not a picture <laughs> live view um but yes, this is a live view of the orbital launch site. You can see the tower uh, on the center right there, the orbital launch mount in the center. Um, they're doing a lot of work on the orbital launch mount to get it ready for Ship 20 static fire campaign. Um, sorry, not Ship 20, Booster 4 static fire campaign. Uh, getting a zoomed in look there on... <laughs> and now Michael's operating the robot. There we go. <laughs> oh, they're getting ready to hook up a chopstick. So the chopsticks, uh, for those who are unaware... <laughs> I'm sorry, are... you, you can't, in the context of space, like, oh yeah, they're getting ready to hook up a chopstick. Oh yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> they got takeout. Um, so the chopsticks are two catching arms that will go on the side of the launch tower. Uh, they look kind of they're named because they kind of look like chopstick moving into position to catch a booster between them um so that is the connector for one of the chopsticks right there uh they should be lifting that in the near-ish future it looks like um but they do have the quick disconnect arm up and now the two chopsticks are the last two that we're aware of that they'll need to install but a lot of ground support work going on right now as well as with the tank farm um as of right now all eight tanks have are not eight, seven tanks have been installed at the 
tank farm. Um, those will hold liquid oxygen, liquid methane, and liquid nitrogen to support flights and ground testing. So they will spend the next few days, weeks, months hooking those up, getting those hooked up to the launch pad to get ready for both Booster Force test campaign as well as the orbital flight test, which is early next year right now. And there's a nice shot of the tank farm right now. And also, I really want to correct myself. Apparently, Chris B is operating the robotic camera at this moment. So thank you, Chris. <laughs> getting a tour shuttle. of getting a tour of the orbital. Yeah, you know, we, we were talking shuttle earlier, so we summoned him, and now he's operating the camera. <laughs> where, where? <laughs> you shuttle three times in the mirror, he pops up behind you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but a live tour of the orbital launch complex. So there we go. Ooh, got some venting going on from one of the smaller tanks there. All right, Adrian, break out the spreadsheet. What does that mean? Like <laughs> oh grass vent. It means yeah. orbital launch and. Two weeks, guys. <laughs> um, but yeah, so, and yeah, you can see there, the orbital tank farm is semi-operational right now. They are, they do have a few lines hooked up. They have done testing on at least one of the tanks. Um, so they are getting closer and closer to having an operational tank farm, which as of right now is a major hurdle uh, in the way of doing any testing on Booster 4. So great to see that's coming along very well. Um, and get a nice shot here of ship 20. Yeah, I was going to say, enhance, jeez. <laughs> yeah, really. Get that zoom. But yeah, ship 20 will be the star of the show this coming week uh, if, it, if it does choose to do a static fire test this week. So it will be interesting to watch that and see how the tiles fare too because we did see them mm -hmm. have some issues during the cryo proof. They tested tank vents for the nose cone header tank and blew some tiles straight off. So... It'll be interesting to see the vibrations, the sound, and all of that from the static fire test, how that will affect the heat shield tiles, which if there's an issue there, that could be an issue during launch. So good to find these issues right now on the ground. Uh, well, we've got a whole bunch of questions popping up already, obviously. Uh, we have Weir Yuan for Musical Wolves, uh, who gave us $5. Thank you so much again for the, for the tips, Musical. Uh, was the vent in the high bay to test rolling out starships and super heavies Astra style? <laughs> I'm going to go out on the limb and say that is not the plan, although that would be entertaining and someone should do it in Kerbal. <laughs> <laughs> You're so impatient. You don't want to load it onto the transporter. You just go fly it. Just... <laughs> oh, I hate that. And while Wolves has the mic, another $2 saying flying tile system. FTS. <laughs> the FTS. Oh, okay. uh, W4WWW, thank you very much for the $5. Is Boost Booster 4 going to be tested on the thrust simulator that is still at the build site? Uh, Good question. So we have, they do have a booster thrust simulator, um, which is essentially a piece of equipment that will kind of mount the booster on top of and will simulate forces on the engine mounts. Um, they'll do that. Um, so they can get an idea of how the booster will respond to structural loads from the engines firing without actually firing engines, without actually risking flight engines. Um, so that is currently, uh, like they said, they're still at the build site right now. There's no indication as to when they'll roll out, how they'll use it, where they'll use it. Um, but there is a booster thrust simulator in processing right now. Also, for you crane watching fans, looks like we're getting some crane action in Boca Chica right now. All right. <laughs> hey, the benefits of having a live view, am I right? Yeah. Uh, Creed's had a question about the cranes, actually. Uh, okay, do you think, of course. Do, do you think that they'll have to move Franken Crane for the Starship static fire? Depending on where it is. So right now, it's near the orbital launch pad. Um, maybe they can move it a little further away. They'll definitely, they'll de not definitely, probably want to retract the boom, bring it down a little bit just to be safe, um, but probably not move it out of the site because, and even in the environmental impact report, which we did make a video on, if you want to learn more about, um, they do have a set area for crane storage during orbital flights. Um, it's actually behind the suborbital site tank farm. So um, when they do testing at the orbital launch site, they could probably move the cranes to that side. But right now, since they're doing testing at the suborbital site, they'll want to move the cranes on the other side to the orbital site. Yep. And Fireworking has been very patient. I've seen this question a few times. Thank you, Fireworking. Uh, what are the chopsticks made of? How tough do they have to be for it to catch super heavy? And I have a question for Ian. Do you like pineapple pizza? <laughs> Ian, pineapple. Oh. Uh, <laughs> we'll answer that last one quickly. I'm a picky eater. So I will have to answer no. I love pineapple on its own, but I'm a pepperoni kind of guy. You tried yeah. pepperoni and pineapple together, though. 
I think it's a step above Canadian bacon. I'd try it. (laughs) But yeah, anyway, the chopsticks are made out of, I guess, steel tubes. They're definitely made of some sort of metal tube um, that they welded together. Uh, The chopsticks have been under construction for months now. But um, yeah, they're made out of large metal tubes um, that are designed to be strong enough to catch a landing booster. So they are very strong. No doubt about that. Yeah, it's a, it's a, we, there are a lot of nicknames for the things that are going on in Boca Chica because, well, there's so many things going on. You just have to create, create, think of creative names. The chopsticks are the arms that are literally go, like a Starship vehicle, or no, sorry, a star, uh, super heavy booster is going to be conducting a landing burn above the right next to the launch complex, slow down enough that those that it, it, the booster has these little mounting points at the top that can rest on these arms, and then the arms carry the weight of the booster so that the booster doesn't need to have landing legs. That's what we're talking about. And yes, that's still mm-hmm. as insane as it sounds. Unreal. But it's really where they're going to go with it. So, oh, man, I, yeah. <laughs> and also to make it even crazier the chopsticks aren't just catching it the chopsticks are going to put the vehicles onto the pad right yeah so super heavy it already has the mounting points that'll be simple to pick it up uh, and put it on the pad starship also we've seen have similar mounting points as well under the forward fins just grab it like there put it on top of super heavy done so they won't need to have frank and crane there forever they'll be able to use an integrated crane on the launch tower to stack the vehicles which will make it easier and less time-consuming, have less hardware and less stuff cluttering the site. Uh, Paulus Plane. Uh, sizable tip here, 200 Nor- uh, North Korean dollars, the uh, Norwegian <laughs> Krone. Uh, thank you very much for that, Paulus. Hello, dudes. Have you seen SpaceX vision concepts for SpaceX starships and things? Uh, have some more North Korean dollars. Love from Norway. That's, that's, uh, I just did the conversion. That's 2350. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Appreciate the support. Um, have, have you seen the concepts? I, I'm Possibly. not sure. I'm not sure exactly what they're referring to there, unfortunately. Yeah. But... Okay. Uh, and then Credence with seven saying it's really big and Bluezilla moved. We have a trend. Thanks. Um, and from Amiga clone, could SpaceX modify the approach and docking system of Dragon so we could dock on the Russian side of ISS? Um, in theory, yeah. But yeah, if you yeah if you took a Russian docking port and installed it on Dragon, I guess. <laughs> but I don't know. I I don't know why the benefit of doing that would be. Um, yeah. The, both Starship and Dragon are going to use the, what we refer to as like, oh, oh, wait, hold on. What's the name of the, the docking standard? That a pass. That one, DSS. thank you. Yeah. Um, there's a standard docking uh, port that is used on Starliner, Dragon, and will be used for the Lunar Gateway, so that includes the Starship landing system um, to, to dock to whatever it needs to. Um, not plan- no plans for it to dock to the Russian side of the station. Uh, they're actually, this is not really related to Dragon itself, but there have been, uh, in the past, Soyuz that flew with A-Pass docking ports installed mm. on them. Sort of Frankensteined in, they look really weird, but it has happened in the past, very likely wouldn't happen in the future, just to be clear, but it has, hap- the theory has been applied in the past. I'm Googling this really quick, because I don't know if I've seen this. I don't know where it was used. I believe it was used, not Apollo Soyuz, but... Certain missions. I don't know what. Um. Pause the stream one moment. We're looking stuff up. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Uh. Uh, While you guys are looking that up, uh, DD View points out that the chopstick name comes from Karate Kid and Mr. Miyagi catching flies with chopsticks. (laughs) Oh, okay. So they put it on a Soyuz vehicle to dock to the port that shuttle would use on Mir. So they tested it on a Soyuz vehicle, oh, okay. So that to make sure the port was ready to support shuttle visits to Mir. There we go. Okay. You learn something every day, and it does look very weird. And actually, to add on to that, the shuttle port on Mir was not intended for shuttle. It was intended for Buran. Oh jeez. Uh, now you're really gonna summon Crispy. <laughs> All right. Also, <laughs> a, a, a related fun fact for those of you that get to visit Atlantis at the Kennedy Space Center Visitor Complex. The docking port that is installed on Atlantis in that display is not the ISS docking port. It's the Mir docking port. 
there were two separate ones. It was slightly different. Mm. Yep. Wow, that I did not know. Anyway, it's completely off topic now. No. <laughs> <laughs> it uh, happens. Well, while we are completely off topic, though, uh, Thomas came back with another fifty uh, Norwegian Krone, uh, who has says, "Have you heard that Norway is building a launch pad for polar orbiting satellites?" And the uh, spaceport is working together with Rocket Factory Augsburg. I have, yeah. There's a German startup that's creating their their own rocket, and they will uh, be able to launch north from Norway uh, into polar orbits very effectively. Obviously, it's not a good low inclination orbit launch site. For that, you want to be launching from near the equator because physics. Um, but for polar orbiting satellites, which are obviously also very common, uh, yeah, that would be very cool, and that would be, uh, you know, one of the one of those European launch sites hopefully coming up. We're hoping to see that, and we're hoping to see some of those launch sites in England as well um, for some launch sites outside the United States to come online. That would be really cool. All right. Um, question here from Vipul Podar, who asks, how close is SN20 and 21 to the final design? Final, de all right, what do you mean by final design? <laughs> uh, operational des design, I, I guess, is, is another question here that uh, he, he said. So probably ones where they're going to start properly running missions with. So Ship 20 does not have any sort of payload bay. That's the most obvious thing. There's no uh, payload bay that can house satellites. There's not a crew cabin. There's not a, I don't know, they, they don't have... It's unclear whether the tanker versions of Starship will use the payload space to carry more fuel or if they'll just be empty and the, use the main propellant tanks. Um, but either way, you know, so this version of the Starship does not have any payload capability. Um, that's probably the biggest difference. Any other differences are going to come from the results of the flight test. If they need to adjust the heat shield because of how re it performs on reentry, uh, adjust the propulsion system in any way, adjust the fins and things, any aerodynamic surfaces. That's all stuff that we don't know yet because they have to conduct an orbital flight test to get more data and see if there are any changes needed. Um, this is just the design they think uh, will work for orbital flights, uh, but that's why you do test flights. So um, it's kind of hard to say, but the biggest difference that we know is coming is adding payload capability. And even then, they're not sure what the payload bay door will look like. Right. Will it be just a little one opening in the cylindrical section? Will it be sort of a giant chomper where it opens? It, it it seems like they're not working on that right now. But and for the eventual tests, uh, W four WWW uh, gives us five dollars and says danger cam eventual repair fund. <laughs> the, it, it, the, the, yeah, it's called danger cam for a reason. <laughs> yep. Mm -hmm. uh, and wolves for two dollars. She says, "Can we do a shuttle stream? No shuttles." <laughs> uh, Listen, I think the I think a. Dedicated shuttle stream with both Chris's is pretty much inevitable at this point. I'm not going to commit to it, but we've heard we've heard the requests and we'll work on it. All right. We'll make it the Christmas special. NASA Space. Lab. There you go. Oh. The Christmas special. Oh, no. Uh, <laughs> also, uh, interesting. You're mentioning shuttle with the two Aries One fans on stream. <laughs> High five. <laughs> I listen. I'm a shuttle fan too. I'm not ashamed oh, yeah. to admit it. Oh yeah. Uh, in theory, Brian asks. Could F9 land with chopsticks? Uh, no, because they're like the only mounting points that would be there for the any chopsticks to catch would be the grid fins. I do not believe the grid fins can support the weight of the entire booster. Um, so no, there there needs to be a mounting point on the booster for those sticks to catch. Also, you would need to install catch arms at like 39A or something, which don't exist. Um, you can't use the ones in Boca Chica because Falcon 9 isn't launched from there. And also, even, like the dimensions are completely different. Super Heavy is so huge compared to a Falcon 9. Um, so no, that's not something that's possible with any non-trivial amount of work. And it already has the landing legs and grid fins, which have been proven right. to work dozens of times. So why change? Just keep it going. It's, Falcon 9's on its, it's kind of on its way out anyway. Kind of. It's not it's, anytime soon, but yeah. Production is on its way out, but it's the end is in sight. Here's a, a neat kind of point from Don Colt, uh, who says there is some precedent for large, fast moving systems handling that much weight. Heave compensating marine cranes. Uh, I guess on comparing to the to the chopsticks and how mm -hmm. they're gonna have to really 
really work hard at that. Well, I'm just excitement. I believe Elon's phrase is excitement guaranteed. Like that first catch attempt is going to be something to watch. It's going to be like, a sight to behold in any way, shape, or form. Googling that right now, I'm like, what's a what's a <laughs> that beat a marine crate? Uh, do you think B4 will survive reentry since there isn't yet a cover for the engine section? I think probably. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, they have a lot of data in that flight regime. Falcon 9's been doing that for years. Yes, it's scaled up to the Super Heavy Booster, but I think confidence in that part of the flight should be relatively high. Yeah. And with the steel, it's designed to not even have an entry burn. So from the get-go, it's been designed to just plow straight through re-entry. Let's see. Um, I, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna do this name wrong, but Matthew Toth, uh, since FC was shortened, will MZ stack Starship even for the ground tests? And for me, what is FC and MZ? So Frank and Crane and okay. Mechazilla, right? Oh. Oh, I see. <laughs> yeah. So Frank and Crane, the giant crane that we see just to the right of the tower in this view, and then Mechazilla is, I guess, the name Elon's been using to refer to the catch arms, basically. I was confused for a second because in my mind, MZ is Yosaku Meazawa, oh. and FC is FlightClub.io, <laughs> and I'm like, how do these two relate? <laughs> to be out there stacking the starship. That's I'm like, I, I mean, I know he's flying on Dear Moon, but I don't know how in depth he is under development. <laughs> and I, when I've been seeing FC, I keep thinking Fleet Cam, and I'm like, oh. that's not right either. <laughs> Uh, Phil Wyatt asks, we hear a lot about Orion being the only deep space certified vehicle. What is involved to get this and how long would it take Starship to achieve this? So Orion isn't like created yet. Orion has to complete the uncrewed Artemis one mission first. Uh, but the biggest difference is there's a different rail, different amounts of radiation shielding that they put on spacecraft that are going to go beyond low earth orbit. Um, and then obviously they need different propulsion requirements because Orion has to do maneuvers to get to and from the moon, um, whereas maneuvers in low Earth orbit take less propellant than that. Um, also, power generation requirements are maybe slightly different, things like that. Um, navigation is a little different. You're going beyond the TDRS, the TDRS communications network, so Orion can't rely on that during the entire trip. So you're using the deep space network here on Earth, um, things like that. Um, you'll be using the gateway as a, uh, communications downlink as well. Um, so those are the differences, but as far as getting, you know, qualified, Orion, um, has all those design features built in. And then once they do the uncrewed Artemis one flight, it'll be crew rated and they'll put crew on Artemis two. Um, and then for, so to do the same with Starship, Starship will just need to have all of those radiation and communication and propulsion requirements all built into whatever variant of Starship is going to go to the moon and then uh, conduct an uncrewed test flight and probably a crewed test flight. Artemis 2 is basically a crewed test flight. Um, so kind of a very similar process to be certified to conduct deep space missions. All right, from Joseph Shetler, um, which will fly first, Super Heavy or SLS? Uh, SLS. Yeah, I have to agree. Which, to be fair, I'm probably well. Okay, that is, is that is my honest answer. I currently Artemis One is slated somewhere early next year, probably maybe the spring. If I was gonna like hedge a little bit, um, st the problem with Starship Super Heavy could fly this year. Maybe it probably won't. But the error bars on Starship estimates are way bigger than the SLS estimates. Because SLS, there are official planning dates that get updated semi-regularly. Um, granted, SLS program has had delays. It's also a very, it's a super heavy lift launch vehicle. So plenty of, of expectation there where delays could also happen. Um, but there is at least a firm planning date that is somewhere in the realm of early next year. Mm -hmm. Starship and Super Heavy fluctuates a lot more. But there's a lot of technical work to be done. The ground support equipment is not done. I mean, we're looking at the tank farm. I can see cryo shells that are not there yet. And those tanks that were installed this week, all of that equipment still needs to be installed. They're still working on the tower itself and the catch arm systems on the tower. The orbital launch mount gets worked on every day. Um, and then that's not, that's all of that stuff is before you even get to the actual vehicles. 
Starship 20 has not static fired yet. Booster 4 hasn't done anything yet. And both of those vehicles have to go through testing and not discover any problems that require either more work or just replacing it with the next vehicle in line to have fixes implemented there. Um, and I want to give full credit to Michael Baylor, who is in his reporting on Twitter and things like that, have been very adamant that, look, it can be very deceiving how close they are to orbital launch readiness in Boca Chica. Because, yes, you see a lot of work happening. It is not simple to just install tanks, plug and play, and be ready to go. That's not how this works. There's a lot of testing that has to happen that keeps getting delayed even on its own. And those tests are going to find problems. Um, it is very it is very naive to think that Starship flight this year to orbit with Super Heavy is, is realistic. Uh, which is why I'm going to say, if I had to guess, Artemis 1 happens first before the first orbital test for Starship. Uh, real quick, thank you to Brendan Baker for the tip and to Alejandro uh, for also doing a, uh, a a 10 euro um super chat and saying super chatting again to remind Thomas to not bet for Boeing to be on schedule. It costs him money. You know, I I did <laughs> I lost a bet regarding the Starliner flight to our good friend John Kraus, and yeah, which is why I'm not making any bets. I'm I would answer the question. But you know, I'm not making any more bets. I'm not doing any of that. Uh, and, and thank you again for those for those tips. They do help keep the show operational and make sure that we can uh, continue to provide really good content here. Um, really quick, I believe we are looking at one of those chopsticks. Is actually airborne ooh. right now. It's it's actually being lifted. It's what it looks is like. It? I I am being told that that is in fact what we are looking at. Not sure exactly what they're doing with it, but. Uh, like we said, when you have a live view in Boca, things just kind of start happening. <laughs> it's a lift stream now. Oh, oh no. <laughs> All right, we're going to be here for like four hours. <laughs> As they slowly adjust it up and down. It, yeah, it, I'm, I'm going back in the, the view here. And unless the camera has moved, it is about maybe three feet or one meter higher than it was before. So maybe well, they put it up onto a platform, or maybe it is going airborne. Just to point out, we're kind of coming up on that time where maybe it's time to just plug the stream where you can see this 24-7. Yeah, mm -hmm. we are we are about out here. Um, I think we can go ahead and just and just wrap it up and move over if you want to. I think That's that good. would work. They're, they're nodding. <laughs> All <laughs> right, then we're going to switch things over to the other streams so you guys can follow along with the, the amazing lift action that is coming. Uh, I do want to give a big thank you to everybody who showed up and uh, just participated today from the from the chat. And as a viewer from home, all the, the super chats and tips we got today, they're always wonderful. A big thank you to Ian. Thank you very much for coming and sharing your commentary with us. Thanks for having me. I'm glad to be here as always. And Thomas, thank you very much for sharing your expertise expertise, and not uh, making any bets that are going to cost <laughs> Always a place like money. <laughs> uh, also, a big... does not provide financial advice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, also, I do want to give an extra big thank you to our members as such as well who support us and every week on the show and other broadcasts. We appreciate all of your support. And thank you to everybody who tunes in. We make, you make it all just an absolute pleasure to come hang out on Saturdays and, and talk space. So it's fun. And uh, also a reminder that there is a NASA Space Flight store where you can go to and find wonderful crafted garments for your torso. Uh, you can get all manner of different <laughs> shirts that are, yes. Yes, yikes, <laughs> you bet you concur. Uh, They're constantly updating the t-shirt designs out there. So if you live and breathe all things NASA Space Flight and SpaceX and, and all these other programs, uh, we're, we're sure to have something for you. Um, and uh, just to wrap up, I want to thank you guys. Uh, I've been your host. I'm Matt Anderson, and you can find me on Twitter and Twitch at Bad News Baron. Uh, where can they find you, Thomas? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at TGMetsFan98. Don't make fun of my sports teams, please. <laughs> <laughs> and Ian? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Ian Pineapple. All right. Well, let's, let's go ahead and head over to the live stream then. Thank you all very much. Have a great rest of your day. Bye bye. Have See a ya. great one.
special looks good. Traveling up. Water towers fly! Yes! go down phenomenal. Water down to eat off. Bring it, let's see, eat off. Yikes. You bet. Okay. We don't need any more of these.